Welcome everyone to our spring 2022 career panel. I'm glad you all could join us um, this early evening. Um, we have a lot of great guests to, that you all will hear from. Um, my name is Jay Gash. I'm the Associate Director and Creative Producer of our Youth and Emerging Media Maker programs. I've been with Bayback for a little over five years. And just a little bit about Bayback. Uh, as you know, as participants um, and guests, you'll learn a little bit more. Um, Bayback has been around for 45 years. It is a media making storytelling organization that is really here to support uh, youth like yourselves, young adults, adults, and to really hone in their skills around media making. So for instance, that means video production, that means audio production, that means gaming and animation and anything else you can think of that we're really beginning to build out. Um, many of these programs really look at how we can best educate you all, how we can make sure these programs are as accessible as possible. So that includes giving you all access to laptops, free licenses of, of Adobe, DaVinci, et cetera, um, and also snacks, because you know we like to feed the people. Who wouldn't like that? Um, right? Um, so Dawn is busy with one of our other programs right now, but she is the program director for our Youth and Emerging Media Maker program. Um, and as I mentioned, I'm Jay Gash. I'll let Valerie go ahead and introduce herself. <laughs> We're behind the scenes. Come over here. Hi, everyone. I'm Valerie. I'm the program manager for Youth and Emerging Media Maker programs. Um, I'm so excited that you all made it out today. Okay, I'm the youth program coordinator. You know, most of you. Um, this is our first in person hybrid ish career panel for 2019, I think. So we can kind of say date. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's really exciting. I'm glad you're here. Before you go to the next slide, Valerie, um, I just wanted to give a round of applause to Valerie for helping us put all of this together. Um, and making this happen. work behind the scenes and Valerie put in a lot. So really appreciate you. Awesome. So getting into our career panelists today. So we have Mark Desena, who is to my left. He is the founder and director of Content Films, which is not that far from here, as I heard just recently. Um, Sarah Denham is joining us virtually, so I don't know if we can pin her, maybe. Um, but Sarah is a documentary editor at Pixar Animation Studios. Um, next up to my left, more to my left, is Larry Madrigal, who is a director and producer at Udacity. Um, he just produced a short, or not short, but a feature length film um, called We Were Hyphy, um, and that's out now. Next, we have Mina Kim, who is a forum host at KPV. And last but certainly not least, we have Claytoven Richardson, who is a music producer and vocalist uh, through Claytoven Music. So, can we give a round of applause to all of our panelists? <laughs> so, we'll go ahead and dive right in. Um, and Mark, you are up first. Great. Take it away. I'm going to take my mask off. Permission. I'm back, safe, tested. So um, hi, my name is Mark Desena. I'm a founder of Content Films, a writer, a director, and a producer. Um, full disclosure, Valerie Duran used to work at Content Films, so I think I have an inside track on how I got on this distinguished panel. So thank you, <laughs> thank you, Valerie. I'm a huge fan of um, all everyone's work on the panel. And um, Mina, yes, I have a, I'm a huge fan of Forum, so I listen to it every almost every morning. So um, what got me intrigued about presenting was that Valerie's comment that there's this youth cohorts and um, age from the 20s down to 13 or 14. And I really started to think about, oh, wow, 13 was such a crazy, crazy time. Um, and so I decided to do a presentation to my 13 year old self. Um, yeah, and it was just you know, starting high school. I don't know what some of you are raised your hand 13, 14, 15 ish. Yeah. Yeah, it was, you know, a time where you're thinking, like, what am I going to do with my life? Who am I? You know, are my parents right? Um, yes, they're, the parents are usually always right, <laughs> just, just so you know. Um, but um, yeah, but a, but a spoiler alert. Uh, you know, even with all the worry and thinking about things, um, 
spoiler is it all worked out. I'm here. I, I survived from the time I was 13. I had a production company for 20 years. I have a beautiful wife, two kids, raised in the city. I lived here and I'm presenting today. So, it, you know, just, just relax. It's all going to work out. Take a deep breath, everybody. We're all good. We're all good. Um, so one thing um, that I love to do, you know, when I was 13 um, was that I love to do art. Um, it made me feel good. I used to draw and just, you know, I was lost in time. So I, I wanted to focus on being 13 because that, that was like a magical time for me. So next slide, you can see I, you know, I drew things that I was interested in. My, my very first painting was a, was a, a cry high kick. I love Bruce Lee. Um, I, you know, drew teachers. I was interested in music back then. So Elton John was my first painting with Mick Jagger. Um, of course I drew girls too, because I was, you know, was a, interested in <laughs> that as well. Uh, and I included one little photo of me as the, um, as a senior winning my, winning the most creative and my mom, he just covered up my mom just saying congratulations Mark, because the parents are, are uh, uh, okay. Um, but, you know, from there, so, you know, I, I love drawing and from there I took it, you know, in college, I, I studied all kinds of things. I thought I wanted to be an illustrator, started graphic design, advertising, writing, um, I was on the fencing team. I did some art about fencing. And, and that, that's a great thing as well. Not that there's a career in fencing, but it, organized sports and a team sport is very relatable to filmmaking. So if you're doing that, you know, or just if you're doing any of these things or anything that you like, just keep, keep going because you don't, you don't really know where, where it's going to take you. Um, for me, I, next slide, I, I, um, got a degree in graphic design, so I worked for brands. I started doing print ads and logos and um, some illustrations, um, and then started working more into doing commercials. And But but my career was was around brands. I did brand films and commercials and still do them, actually. Um, and then finally, I got to filmmaking. So it's all this circuitous route um, to get there. But I, I took classes at um, this Film Arts Foundation, which used to be in this building, and much like Dave Actors, you know, classes that I took and got interested in, in production and lighting and editing, um, and you know, created some of my first films. And I started as a what's called a narrative filmmaker, so it's fiction. I wrote scripts and shot films, and and you'll see, I'm definitely. OG because a couple of the two films were shot actually on film. I'm edited on a flatbed um, right across the street. And here is uh, uh, just a, a short reel, some clips of some of the narrative films I did. When a volley of angels passes over your head, you're supposed to smile and say, I love you, not shoot at them. You're supposed to be nice to angels. That's why when you're especially nice, I say thank you. You're an angel, I don't shoot you, do I? <laughs> Opposite, you know, it's about focusing and concentrating 
and doing it over a sustained period of time, it requires a lot of endurance, and you know, that is what Sarah does as well. In some cases, the actual growth of a wedge-shaped vertebral that we're calling cervical vertebral 1.5, C1.5. The cause is believed to have been instigated by the explosive proliferation of cell phone use. We probably use our devices a bit too much nowadays. For some incredible reason, that's passed down to our daughter. I mean, look around you, is there anyone that's not looking down at their phone, wherever they are? I'm kind of attracted to it. That doesn't make any sense. Why does it have to make sense? You slept again? It was before we were dating. Good dating? Sort of. Sort of's a good description. I just thought we had something that night. I didn't think it ended up... You're the one who doesn't believe in that feeling thing. Why me, man? What makes me special? Very short clips, sorry if you don't get all of them, but they're, you know, I, I only have 10 minutes to speak with Scott. Um, but anyway, the, the last film or that you just saw was, um, you know, Pinnacle. It premiered at Sundance. Uh, it closed in the event of life. Uh, it closed the San Francisco Film Festival that played at the Castro. There's a line around the block. My parents are there. All my friends are there, you know, sold out. Um, standing ovation, which is not good. And uh, and a friend of mine came up to me right after the Q&A and he said, Mark, that was a wonderful film, but now are you, next slide. Now are you ready to do a really important film? Mm -hmm. Which part of me was just like, okay. Um, you know, it was my big night. Of course he'd say that, but um, a month later I found myself on the AIDS boards in Kampala, Uganda, with my friend David Bangsberg, who is an uh, infectious disease epidemiologist. And just, I did my first documentary and short film on his work in Uganda at East USF or uh, SF General. So it was kind of a, a, a really sharp turn for me. I, I thought I wanted to be a narrative filmmaker, but then I saw the power of um, doing documentaries. And I've kind of been focused on documentary. Um, I still do narrative work, but this has been sort of what, what I've been focused on for a long time. And here's a, a clip for you to let's see about the intersection. Here. Time now we're at a crossroads. We can continue on this like business as usual path, or we can create solutions for our future generations. The future of humanity and the planet must be built on solidarity, on peoples around the world standing together on a common platform and pushing for the same solution. We're encouraging people how to be in right relationship with others. If you start to reimagine our relationship to the whole living ecosystem, I think we might reroute our activity, not reroute rivers, not reroute waterways. We need to make sure that people are hearing from the frontline communities, the communities that are at the points of extraction that actually have traditional knowledge. We need to have a balance again, a connection with nature, Today, 98% of the farmland is controlled by white folks. And I think our generation is realizing that a piece of our culture and a piece of our souls and our heritage was left behind in those red clays. And we're now in a position to go back. The new economy, uh, post-grow, when we be, call it as you want, but we need something different. This is the main theme of, of robotics, I, I believe, to, to save the planet. People have learned the lesson. We don't have to expect nothing from governments and from the UN system. We have to do it ourselves. If we don't do it, nothing will change. 
So let's do it and let's do it with joy. By looking at how we live, we can find how we can live better, more interconnected lives. And maybe even be happier for it. pertains to filmmaking, not everyone has to direct. You're going to see from this panel that there's so many different aspects of filmmaking that you can take part in, whether it's photography or editing or animation or music. Um, it's it's a, a very rich field to, to dive into, and, and uh, you have a lot lots of time to, to figure it out. Um, next slide. What, what you do is less important. Um, it's more about recreating that feeling that I had that you all might have when you're 13 to do what you love. Um, and that's that's the goal. Next slide. Um, but no pressure. Uh, next slide. It, it'll all work out. Um, at the end, once everyone presents, we'll open it up for a Q&A. So if you have questions, hang on to those, put those in your notes app or write them down. Um, we'll give you all the opportunity to ask them. Sure. All right, up next we have Larry. Cool. It's uh, hard to follow that up. <laughs> Presentation from Lauren. Um, yeah, and I mean, really humbled and uh, nervous to be here. This panel is extremely talented. And, yeah, just like excited to talk to you guys. Uh, I think, but that's what kind of what's all about is like surrounding yourself with creative, talented people. Um, is like what the name of the game is. So, back more on that soon. Uh, so yeah, I'm Larry. Um, I'm both a, my day job is a managing producer for an ed tech company called Udacity, which um, back in the day, uh, Jay and the Bridges Fellowship would come and we do a little in studio workshop with them and ate some pizza and. Did some cool lighting interview setups and had some fun. Yeah, and then uh, on the side, I uh, pursue a, um, I'm an aspiring documentary filmmaker as well. And I uh, spent the last four years working on um, uh, my first uh, feature documentary film called We Were Hyphy, which just premiered April 1st at Cinequest Film Festival. Um, so uh, yeah, I'll talk more about that later, but I think this is the, this is the trailer for We Were Hyphy. Oh, what happened? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> when you watch your TV or listen to some of the popular radio stations, you might be familiar with the term high heat. I think it's the Bay Area explosion. All my close friends the Bay Area explosion. Hyphy is a lifestyle. It's the way we move, talk, walk. And it's an energy that's that surrounds everyone, you know, that, that, that binds us. Many agree Oakland side shows are growing larger, more violent, and are scaring people. If you were at the party and the song came on and we all going down, then we all going down. Hyphy is an energy. Hyphy is a villain. Hyphy is an impact grunge had. Blues and any other genre of music that was totally taken over the nation. Hyphy music is a reflection of the people. So if you listen to a hyphy song, they might be talking about gangster stuff that happens in the streets, but it's just a reflection of what they seen yesterday or what they seen earlier that day, right? 
with so much going on, man. We just losing fans, people was getting killed, people was dying. It's definitely fire, that, that hyphy movement, that hyphy spirit that exists. So we're gonna rebel, we're gonna take over the streets, we're gonna commandeer the streets, and we don't care what they say. We're not just partying, but we're partying in spite of what you're trying to force us to do. All of it is about liberation. It's about getting it out and celebrating. And it's, it's, it's beautiful. The ingredients and the residual impact will live forever. It was a wild ass time. It's hard to recreate because it was an era, it was a time, you know what I mean? It's a time capsule. Hyphy is actually being free. Hyphy is a movement. Hyphy is a lifestyle. Hyphy is powerful. Well, yeah, so that was, that was your hypey. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's just one um, aspect to it. So yeah, I mean, I think with this film, I kind of really realized what I was really what I want to do with filmmaking in general. And I think for me, uh, I grew up in the Bay Area, um, which I'm sure a bunch of you as well. And I think for me, it's spotlighting Bay Area stories that are not typically covered by mainstream media. Um, and I feel like the hype movement is definitely one of those stories that almost made it mainstream, didn't quite, the world didn't quite know what to do with it. And then it kind of got um, a little forgotten. And I think like, there's a lot going on in the Bay Area right now. And it's these kind of stories that I think are kind of a fresh uh, perspective. So uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so I think I was trying to think about what advice I could give and what I could bring to this because I'm still a, um, you know, early filmmaker um, in my career. But I think when I reflect on it, what, what I would love to pass on is like, uh, I had a not traditional um, route to becoming a filmmaker. Uh, I think so I went to SF State, uh, the cinema program, which is a very old, like old, amazing program, by the way, uh, but old and traditional. And it's all, I think a lot of what we were learning in the early 2000s when I was there was go to LA, go to Hollywood, have one thing, like, you know, have one focus and just do that. Like you're gonna be a gaffer or you're gonna be a director. Um, and, you know, that um, worked for, and a lot of my friends followed that path and it worked out. Uh, but for me, I kind of did it differently. I, um, I decided to stay in the Bay Area and work freelance jobs, um, some commercial work, some, you know, um, working in tech and just helping friends on their film sets and short films, stuff like that. And I learned that like every job you do, you learn something from it. And every person you meet, uh, you gain that, that net, your network grows, you gain that, that fellow creative um, and you help each other and work on each other's stuff. And then you, you grow from there. So, um, yeah, just, I mean, like, it's like keep meeting people, keep helping each other on, on projects, and, and you never know what's going to happen. You never know what you're going to learn. Uh, next slide, please. So, yeah, um, like I said, uh, I work, uh, I, I currently still have a day job uh, working for Udacity, making educational videos. Um, still in the video production field. I shoot, edit, do motion graphics, um, direct people on camera, uh, direct talent. Um, but yeah, I mean, I like, uh, I got out of college and wanted to stay in the Bay Area and that was uh, the work that was here. So I joined Udacity eight years ago as an editor and now I'm a um, managing producer of the video team, which is, I still love my job a ton um, and it helps fuel my passion projects outside of work. So um, yeah, next slide. So yeah, to that, about four years ago, actually one of my coworkers that I worked uh, on the video team with, he's the producer. He approached me because I'd always tell him about the hyphy movement. He's not, he's from Ireland. He's actually not from the Bay Area. So I just send him music and stuff. And I, it was a big part of my life at the time. So I was like, always just telling people about it. Uh, and he was like, yo, we should make a, like a short film about this and just like release it on YouTube. And then I was like, sure, why not? So with no funding or any backing, we just kind of used our own gear, borrowed gear. And uh, uh, a lot of people helped and volunteered their time. And we, started making this short film that we were just gonna release online. And then um, I think a testament to the hyphy and Bay Area community is every time we met someone, they would say, you should talk to this person, you should explore this. So that just, it just kept growing from there. And then eventually we decided, let's just go for it and make it a feature. Um, 
And so, uh, yeah, they just, I literally finished it in like March 10th was when I submitted it to submit quest. So still, still pretty fresh. Uh, and yeah, it was just, it was four years in the making. Like, I feel like if you don't have money, sometimes you have to sacrifice time, vice versa. So that, that was the big, uh, kind of sacrifice there was time. Uh, yeah. So uh, next slide, please. Yeah. And I think like, like I was saying earlier, every project, you learn something different. I think what I really learned, um, cause I studied. Uh, like Mark, I was narrative originally, and then never thought I would make documentaries. But I, um, I also edited Wheeler Hyphy, so I'm a, I always had a, a, a kind of natural kind of pull towards editing as well. Um, so I think because editing and documentary filmmaking goes so hand in hand, I, I realized that documentary was the path I wanted to go down um, because I feel like you can really bring the story together in the editing room. So um, yeah, while making, I really learned that like story development is such a major, major part of documentary filmmaking like just as important as narrative. Um, you don't get, you don't necessarily sit down and write a script, but you have to really put in the work ahead of time during the shoot and then in the editing room to kind of bring the story together. You have characters, they have growth. So um, yeah, this was the story graph I put together while making it. Um, oh. And yeah, it was, it was, a, it was an important uh, lesson I'd say, yeah. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and so my next step is I'm also, I also make uh, instrumental uh, hip hop and electronic music outside of film and uh, I'd love to continue to work with other Bay Area musicians and make more uh, documentary work um, about the Bay Area music scene as well. Uh, so that's kind of my next step. Like I said, I'm early on uh, in my career and uh, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, the conclusion is I'd say just surround yourself with creative people and help each other, you know, like um, you never know what projects are gonna lead to what and what skills you're gonna learn from that and what people, you know, you're gonna help them, they're gonna help you. And it's not just help, it's like they might inspire you and you might take your art a different way. So just, um, yeah, surround yourself with, with creative people and, and just jump on any project you can. You never know what's gonna happen. I didn't think I was gonna make a narrative, or sorry, a documentary feature film um, when I started working at ASCII, so yeah. We are going to move on to Mina Kim. Are you ready, Mina? I am. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. So I have to follow documentary filmmakers with my horrible slides. But anyway, what you can see on the picture there is the job that I have right now. I am actually the co-host of a live call-in radio program that airs on KQED called Forum. And it's uh, on from 9 to 11 every day. And my co-host, Alexis Madrigal, he actually does the 9 o'clock hour, which is designed to go kind of deep in the Bay Area and focuses primarily on the Bay Area. It has, um, it's heard primarily in the Bay Area as well, which is why. And then I host the 10 o'clock hour, which um, airs here as well as in other parts of the state. So in Southern California, as well as Northern California, which is why the 10 o'clock hour has a little bit more of a statewide focus. And in a lot of ways, this is my dream job, but it's a job I didn't even know I dreamed of having <laughs> until like it sort of like worked its way there. I, I ended up working my way towards this job through a series of kind of mistakes and um, kind of realizations that I had never explored when I was younger. But these days I get to talk about issues that I really care about on this show, issues of racism, police violence, issues about water in the state, wildfires, immigration, income inequality, all of those things. Um, and, and on forum, we get to spotlight communities that have rarely had the spotlight in mainstream media as, as Larry was just talking about. And I get to talk to just really amazing and incredible people. And then these days I do it from home. So the picture on the right, um, is me kind of with my makeshift home studio. And this is actually pre-pandemic. This was a day when um, I had to jump on. I wasn't supposed to host, but my previous co-host, Michael Krasny, was losing his voice. And so they, they called me and said, we need you to jump on from home. And can you just like kind of create this setup because you have some basic equipment at your house that you could probably use to do it. And so some of the folks at KQED on the social team thought it would be really funny to share this image to give people a sense of what it is like for journalists who do work remotely and who do broadcast 
from home, not knowing that in a couple of short, in a few short months, this would actually become the norm for a lot of the broadcasters during the pandemic, uh, because it became no longer possible to broadcast from home and to sit in these airtight <laughs> studios with guests when they were trying to figure out what was happening with COVID-19. So the other thing that's really funny about it is that I, I actually almost never wear those pajamas either. Okay, those, I just randomly put those on because I was cold, but I almost never wear them, but it's become sort of this thing now. Okay, Katie, what do you really think of? Those are my, those are my PJs. Um, but uh, it's, it's so awesome to be asked to be on this panel. It's really an honor. And I, I really wanna thank Bayback for asking me to be here. Valerie told me that it would be great to, to share with you a little bit about how I got to this, this job. And I thought it would be fun to share the story of how I even got in the door at KQED because I think it's a little atypical. So I was doing this fellowship program in San Francisco uh, called Coro, and I was doing it shortly after graduating from college. I think it was a few years out from graduating from college. I was a gender studies major in college, never worked in journalism, never had plans to be in journalism. I thought what I would end up doing is working for a nonprofit organization focused on gender equity. And I may still do that, who knows, but, but right now uh, it feels like radio is the thing. But anyway, Coro is this program. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but it places you in all the different sectors. So, or in several sectors, not all of them, but it tries to put you like in a corporation, in a government organization with a labor union. It, it does this for a week to a month at a time. Um, and one of the entities that they placed us in during media week for me was the San Francisco Chronicle. And so during that week, I got to shadow reporters, I got to shadow an editor, and I realized that I loved what journalists do. I loved the way that they could meet and talk with people and be at the center of major events and help people understand what was going on. And even the deadline pressures kind of got my um, interest in adrenaline going. And I thought, wow, maybe there's something here. And it was, and it was not a feeling that I had ever had. Um, at the very end of your Coral Placement, you get to choose a sector to spend a month in and learn everything you can and provide services to them based on whatever skills you brought with you. Um, but you have to get paid by the organization that lets you come and spend the weekend. And what I mean by getting paid is the organization has to give a donation to Coro. And so when I told my colleagues um, who were in the program with me that I wanted to do this at a media organization, they were like, there is no way, there is no way a media organization is going to pay Coro to have you hang out with them and learn everything that you want to do. And what organization would you want to hang out with anyway? And um, this is so random, but I was like, you know, that's a really good question. Do I want to try to hang out in a print organization? Do I want to try to see if I can get um, a media, a radio, a television organization to let me spend time with them? And I thought like, okay, what is something that I liked to do? What is something that I liked to do as a kid um, to help me kind of make this decision? And I realized that one of the things that I liked doing when I was a kid was reading out loud. <laughs> and so I was like, you know what? I'm gonna just see if KQED will let me hang out with them for a while. So I kind of scanned KQED and saw that they had this half hour weekly program at the time called Pacific Time. It aired uh, like once a week, I feel like on Thursdays. And it was a show that focused on issues that affect Asia and Asian Americans. And I thought, well, I'm Asian American and I definitely have issues. So I decided to just cold call them with this pitch that I was just gonna like um, hang out, learn everything I can, do anything that they needed me to do. And I think the senior editor at the time, of, at the time for Pacific Time thought I was like a freelancer who was gonna come and, and share some ideas. So he agreed to take a meeting with me. And so, you know, I remember we were in this meeting room and I told him my background, which, you know, included zero experience at all in journalism. Um, I told him I wanted to hang out and learn everything that I could and help in any way I could. And he looked at me like really skeptical. And then when I told him that KQED needed to make a donation <laughs> to have me do all of this stuff, <laughs> Um, you know, was that cool? He was like, no. <laughs> and he was like, this meeting is over. <laughs> like, you have wasted my time. 
And I don't know why, but I didn't get up from the table. I think in any other circumstance, I probably would have like gotten up from the table, apologized for wasting his time and walked out the door. But there was something that like glued me to the chair. And I remember my mind started racing, you know, for like ideas and strategies. And I finally said, look, if I can find someone to pay Coro for me to hang out with you at KQED, will you let me do it? And he didn't say yes. And he didn't say no, though. And he said, if you find someone who is willing to do that, well, then call me. And, you know, we can see if that's even something we would consider. So I went back, scanned the Coro alumni database for an alum with any connection to KQED at all. I found someone, I talked to him, told him how passionate I was about learning this. Like this was my one and only chance, right? After this, I was gonna pursue jobs in the nonprofit sector. And, and uh, but if, if he thought I, I had anything that would make me a decent journalist, like would he be willing to fund this sort of internship I was trying to create for myself over at Pacific Time at KQED. And I guess he saw some, because he said, okay. <laughs> I will, I think it was two, two, $2,500 was what the donor had to give to, to Coro. And he's like, I'll do it. Um, and so that's what I did. So I got in, I, I, I convinced them to let me stay there. I learned everything I could. I tried to be like super helpful with anything that they, they needed from like getting them coffee to like transcribing um, interviews and that kind of stuff. And then um, I asked them if I could produce my own like little two minute thing just to learn how to do radio production and feature, feature production. And they were like, sure, go right ahead. And there was no obligation for them, of course to play it on air, but I did this like little two minute piece about an all Asian American cast doing a Shakespeare play, which was sort of rare at the time. And, uh, and they aired it. So then they were like, why don't you do another one? So I did another one. This was like a little bit longer. I think I profiled um, a Thai American labor organizer and they aired that too. I mean, and it's not like they say, wow, like, these are great, or you really got something. They don't say anything to you. If anything, the feedback is constantly like, they're only telling you what you need to fix and what you need to do wrong. But just the fact that they aired it made me think, maybe they, maybe they hear something. Um, and so then I thought, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy like a secondhand mic and recorder, and I'm gonna go out there and try to find some stories off the news. And I'm gonna see if the next stories I do, they're actually gonna be willing to pay me for. And I think I did like a story about a Japanese yodeler and like they were, they agreed to pay me for that. And then they agreed, we agreed to pay for like a couple of health stories and things like that. And so then I was like, all right, now I'm gonna quit my job. The, the one that I have like, you know, rent a bedroom that was like literally a closet. I think you know, rent was about like five, 600 bucks a month. Um, and see if I could survive financially doing this and for KQED. And slowly but surely, like I had to do other jobs. Like it, it took a long time, but um, slowly but surely they started to let me do things like fill in as a reporter. And uh, you can go to the next slide now. And as a reporter, I got to do stories that I never thought I would be able to do. So. Um, I was able to profile uh, a person who was my hero when I was a gender studies major. That's Yuri Kochiyama on the left there. Uh, I, you know, had to cover the, the domestic violence scandal that engulfed San Francisco Sheriff Tamras Nagarimi. Um, and then I, uh, you can go to the next slide. And then I, you know, did these stories that just really gutted you, the stories um, about the murder of Oscar Grant and, and the murder of these 20 little kids and how California was reacting to it and how California was drawing connections to the plague of gun deaths that were happening everywhere, but particularly in parts of the Bay Area. And, and that's how I just got so hooked and passionate about it. And you know, I went from being a, a reporter to then their daily news anchor and now to their um, live call and talk show host. And it's really what I realized made being a live call and talk show host my dream job is that um, I'm more of a facilitator, I think, than I am like a, 
and a, uh, like a performer. And so, so to be able to, to give our audience and our listeners a space to be heard and seen and to facilitate conversations that expand or change people's minds or help people feel more connected to each other or, or to help illuminate like how the game is played, like the, the political game, the power game that creates the, the kinds of social structures that we see right now. Those are all, um, those are all really important to me. And then at the same time, we get to do fun stuff too. These are just slides of sort of some of the harder things that really shaped um, how I understand the importance of what constitutes news and journalism, but we also get to do uh, fun things that delight on the program as well. And so a few things that I learned from the process of finding my way to this role is that is you really do need to listen to those moments when there is like something, there's like a fire in you and you really need to not um, dismiss the little things that give you joy, like <laughs> realizing I like to read out loud. Like those are, those are the moments that are telling you who you are and like what you love. And, and, and the last lesson that I think I learned, which was, um, you know, from sort of basically forcing my way into KQED, but constantly feeling like unsure if I really belonged is the recognition that um, if you are following your fire, then you, you belong anywhere <laughs> where that is being, being lit and further, um, you know, where, where, where it's being, um, it's being helped to sort of blossom and, and grow. And, and so that, that, those are the things that I learned along the way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nina. Up next, we have Sarah. Sarah, uh, let, can we do a test to check your audio? Make sure it's coming through okay? Uh, I think you're muted. Oh, yep. Awesome. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, do you want to show my clip first, or should I just start? Hello? We could start. Yeah, we'll start with your video first. Oh, okay, great. Terrific. Nona's about a grandmother who has her whole day planned out. It's a one time a year kind of special day, and it's surprisingly interrupted by her granddaughter, the one person who she probably can't really say no to. This story is one for the grandmas that don't like to bake cookies. Nona passionately loves wrestling, but she also really loves her granddaughter. And it's a story about those two things really coming into conflict in a really fun, fun way. I had an idea about what the sensibility could be. And once the team came on, they really informed what that sensibility was. They are as responsible for how this looks, if not more so than I. The designs that he gave our set designer, it was this one living room box. We have this older person who's kind of stuck. So like the rug on the floor is nothing but boxes. She's in a box when she's sitting in the chair. It's enclosed her. We're just trying to play square on square on square to try and replicate that idea of a ring. He knew that he wanted something that kind of had an L.A. vibe. We had an amazing set modeler and dresser that came on, and she just found her inner grandma and created all of these wonderful little touches. Just yeah. enough to where you can get an idea of her family and things that she cherishes. And she would present those, and then Louie would react, and he really, really responded to just how personal it felt and how personal she went with it. Nona's got stuff that she's had for a really long time. She doesn't have a lot of stuff that's brand new. And so making sure that you can feel that. Animation on the show, challenging because we had three different styles of animation. I would tell my, my animation student, Ben, I was like, Ben, you know, like real world just has that sense of naturalistic but fun animation. When we go into the wrestling world, I want that to be crazy really exaggerated so it feels like a cartoon our animation team watched a lot of wrestling 
put the brainstorming moves. I left that to Ben a little bit. I would just tell him like, you know, A, whatever the move is really big and broad and goofy. So like, there was one time we were working with the, the first wrestling, you know, match, right? The little guy runs right at the big guy and hits him. We need him to accordion and have the feet go weird and like just make it like a extreme, like everything's kind of like broad, overly broad, like cartoonishly broad. Wrestling's a soap opera, so every match is a story. So why not find little stories for my animation team to understand like what their intentions are? I like that everyone that I work with is just such a pro. There's such a desire to do a good job with everything that every all touch that it's just truly special to be around that, to be around artists that care very much about everything being good. So we started with something, but then what we ended up with really was a culmination of everybody contributing. So it was a beautiful thing. <laughs> Sarah, do you want us to play your second video too? You know, why don't I just jump in? Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, this is super inspiring, and I feel like I'm in such great company and um, so much resonance with all of you. It's great hearing your stories, and I wish I'd heard them when I was 15 and not having a clue. Um, anyways, uh, like Mark, I kind of my my in my beginning in was um, an interest in drawing and just making things. Uh, we were sort of like, you know, uh, feral fort building children running around in the wild and uh, drawing kind of took a hold of me. And um, uh, but instead of uh, Elton John, for me, it was Stevie Nicks. I was I just kept drawing Stevie Nicks over and over and over again. Uh, gave me joy. I don't know why. I do know why. But anyways, um, and uh, so my um, I went to art school. I got into this school um, that was uh, free to everyone in New York City. And that was my out from Lowell, Massachusetts. Um, neither of my parents were artists or filmmakers. I didn't know anyone really who was an artist or a filmmaker. Um, and so when I got into this free school, it was kind of like, OK, I guess you can go there. Um, and um, went to New York City at 18. It was incredible. Um, and uh, ended up um, skipping out of my painting class and going to the film class and was kind of hooked. And it was a it was a strange kind of film education because it was very super, super arty um, and not necessarily preparing me in the least for the real world or any kind of real world film jobs. Um, but it was all really fascinating. And I got to know a lot of really cool um, East Village independent experimental filmmakers. Um, when I finished, oh, and I, I just wanted to say uh, one other silly fun fact. My first roommate in New York City, there were no dorms at the school. The school was called Cooper Union. And my first roommate in New York City was a Franciscan nun. And that was, it. That was actually like the best experience I think that I could have had because she was just super, super grounding. And that situation for me made New York feels so doable and so accessible. And it was it was pretty extraordinary experience now that I think back on it. It was really amazing. Um, anyways, finished film school. I mean, finished art school, didn't really know what I wanted to do. And sort of one of the first sort of jobs, I was doing all kinds of things, working in a bar and um, ripping tickets at the film forum, seeing tons of movies. Um, and uh, ended up getting a job at a photography museum in the bookstore. And I did that for a while, for about four years. And I just didn't know, I kind of knew that I wanted to be in film. I had had an internship that was kind of like, didn't really lead to anything and was a little bit frustrating. Um, and uh, so I was in this photography bookstore learning a ton about photography um, and was like, I don't know what I want to go to school for. I don't know if I want to do art history, museum studies. I was kind of interested in all of it, just kind of taking it all in. And um, I finally realized that, you know, film was going to give me this access to like do it all really. Um, and so um, I applied to graduate schools and I ended up in Iowa City, Iowa, which everyone now is always like, oh, did you go to the writer's workshop? And it's like, no, I didn't go to the writer's workshop, but we drank with the writers, which seems to count for something, I think. 
Um, and, you know, again, Iowa City, everyone's sort of like, you wait, you moved from New York to Iowa? And it was like, yeah. Um, and it, that transition was actually really great, too, because um, it was Iowa City provided this this really um, this really different kind of experience, this very campus experience. Um, and all that sort of option paralysis that you can get in New York, like you can stand on any single street corner and go like, where should we go to dinner? And just like talk about that for 15 minutes. In Iowa City, it's sort of like, you've just got a couple options, you know, and you just do it. And it was a super progressive town, um, really exciting group of collaborators in my, in all my, um, my colleagues um, in the graduate, graduate school program. Um, I ended up uh, teaching a class, which was really cool. Um, and I'm going to share one piece of wisdom because I got this from a student that was in one of my classes. The, these Iowa kids were the best. And actually one of my oldest friends is um, works with me here at Pixar and uh, is someone that I met in a screenwriting class in Iowa in 1997, so a long time ago. Um, but this great piece of advice is this student of mine once said to me, I like to do something new every day. And I was like, holy crap, like that is the wisest thing I've ever heard in my life. And I still think about that guy and I still think about that sense of having a sense of curiosity in the world and kind of putting yourself in new situations or walking down a new street. It doesn't have to be big, but just that having that sense of sort of wonder and curiosity. So anyways, I always, I always loved that. And I always, you know, I appreciate that as you're kind of coming up in the world, there's there's always learning opportunities, and you know, from your students, from your mentors, it's it's just from everywhere, and it's constant. Um, you know, just yesterday, I was like trying to put gear back in a box, and it's like, how does this work? You know, it's like the questions kind of never stop in terms of like how to do things and how to move through the world. So, anyways, I always love that. Um, after Iowa, it was like I kind of. I actually wanted to go back to New York, but I kind of didn't know how to, it's like leaving the atmosphere and not knowing how to get back in. And I ended up out here um, for a relationship that imploded in about two months. And, um, and I kind of fell back on my old bookstore situation. Um, I got a job in a mystery bookstore down in San Mateo. Um, I, I love the genre. And so I was reading a ton. I actually took a class in mystery fiction at Iowa. And so um, I got this job and again, ended up staying there for like four years because it was safe and I was making money and I was paying my cheap rent and, um, and I loved it. I, it was great. I was like, you know, hand selling books and talking about books and thinking about books. Um, and after about four years, something, uh, what happened? Like a friend of mine. So, okay, I'm 35. And this friend of mine was moving out of town. And so this freelance gig that she was doing for a documentary filmmaker kind of freed up. And she was like, well, you could do this. And then in the meantime, I'm living in a loft. It's me, um, my partner who's a musician and another couple, an architect and a painter. It was very San Francisco artists. And the painter was kind of getting faint, was getting more and more successful selling his artwork on eBay. And so, I was like, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to intern. I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to cobble together this freelance life and I'm going to sell artwork on eBay. I'm going to do transcription for this documentary filmmaker. Cause that's what, cause Heather said, I can do that job. And, um, and I'm going to commit myself to, if I like, if I don't quit my job and I don't commit to finding out what this film world is all about. It's never going to happen for me. And so I just was like, you know what? And, and it was a deeper realization that I think for all those years, I had been sort of having this idea that interning was, um, was something that uh, the privileged do. And indeed it is, but, um, but that I, I couldn't afford to play that game. And I think that I, you know, I came to this realization that I was kind of writing myself out of the game. And the reason that I, and I realized ultimately is because it was out of fear. It wasn't because I couldn't work in cafes and just get by and pay my own rent. It was because I was afraid 
that I didn't know everything, that I would be found out that, I mean, this is pre-imposter syndrome language, right? But it's it's all those things that you think, oh, I, I don't know enough or, um, you know, I, uh, and so you, you set up these barriers for yourself. Anyways, I'm 35, I'm realizing this, I'm having this moment of like, oh my gosh, you know what? I'm just gonna do it. I'm gonna get coffee for people and I'm gonna figure out what people do, what are the different jobs? Cause I didn't know any of that stuff. Um, and I ended up getting an internship. So I'm like interning, I'm selling artwork on eBay. I'm doing transcription and, um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to Pixar. Sorry if I'm taking a long time to do this. Um, basically within the year I ended up, so I worked at a post house. It was really great. And the people were so kind and teaching you everything about all those jobs. And I'm answering phones and getting coffee for people, but I was learning like, what do the guys in the machine room do? And what are the, what's a dub monkey, you know, all that stuff. And um, I was also, I also found out about this uh, documentary project and I started logging um, footage for this woman. And she worked at Pixar and was borrowing the deck from this documentary crew at Pixar. And um, she had a shoot one Sunday night and, you know, I didn't have a day job. So I was like, well, if, if you've got the deck on Sunday, I'll just stay at your house and I'll just finish logging it. And um, so when she brings the deck back to Pixar on Monday morning, they're like, oh, well, you know, your shoot ended at six o'clock last night. Um, you probably need it back next weekend. She's like, oh, no, no. The person that's logging for me, like, you know, just stayed at my house late till three o'clock in the morning or whatever logging. That was me. And um, and she um, and they were all like, oh, wait, who's this person? And that was like part of my in as well. And when I um, started working at Pixar, I was freelancing. I was transcribing interviews. Um, Mina, you said you've done that as well. Um, and that was, uh, you know, that was my in. It was just freelance. I wasn't very good at it, to be perfectly honest. But um, what it did make me realize is that um, there was kind of a place for me in this group because I was super attaching to content. I've never been a very, very technical person. Um, I still am not a super technical person, but I love content. I love writing. I love story. And so I was kind of able to attach to that and able to um, sort of parlay that interest into sort of assistant editing, logging. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I've been here at Pixar working in our in-house documentary crew for uh, 15 years now. And I've just, I've been directing now for the last three years, which has been really, really exciting because I get to have those one-on-one -on -one interviews with people uh, around the studio about their creative process. And, you know, kind of because I bring all of this, you know, sort of art school and photography and just all these sort of interests and life experience and um, quite frankly, like meanderings and not knowing what the heck I'm doing. Um, I feel like it just um, being in this situation now is just has really like clicked for me and it's not something that I ever like you know I mean I went to I went to grad school for film but I still had that sort of like I want to direct I think because I don't really know what any other jobs are um anyways uh so yeah that was my path I don't know if there is anything to be learned from it it's so easy to say in hindsight you know you you did this and that was great and you did this and that worked out for you and the truth is like a lot of it is luck too so you've got to be ready if those opportunities come to your door um and you you know you because you've put the work in because you've been thinking about it because you've been working with friends and making stuff and giving notes and taking notes and having those kind of collaborative discussions with people when the opportunity comes, you'll know that it's right. And um, so, yeah, I, am I bumping up against time here? I feel like I am. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Round of applause. Thank you very much. Yeah. So Clay, are you ready for us? Yes, I think I am. Oh, awesome. Well, you can go ahead and get started. Okay, so I'm I'm come I'm a little bit different than than everyone else here. I am a musician, uh, songwriter, producer. I'm totally up in the audio world. So um, 
I was thinking about doing a presentation, but it's kind of difficult. I've been in the music business for 49 years and it's kind of hard to kind of encapsulate that in like a few minutes. <laughs> so what I think I will do is just talk about just some of the highlights of my life and um, uh, my path. So it started in elementary school. I was, um, this gentleman came to our class and said, hey, I'm starting a new music program and I want to find out if there's anybody who wants to take music. So, you know, I was really interested because I was really blessed and my father, he gave it up to do a family, but he used to play for B.B. King. He was part of B.B. King's band, a touring band, and he gave it all up to do the whole family thing. Uh, he really got into that because I have a sister and like three brothers. <laughs> so he really put us all in the family thing. But uh, uh, so I said, okay, cool. Uh, of course, they had these little song flutes, you know, they call them recorders now. And, uh, and so I remember the first day he came and he had a clarinet and the clarinet had this clear plexiglass mouthpiece that I thought was the coolest thing ever, you know, as a kid. And we're sitting there going, you know, uh, 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 trying to play this stuff, right? <laughs> and while we're doing that, he's going, I'm like, whoa, I wanna do that, I wanna do that. So I was really excited, I told my parents, a couple of days later, a couple of weeks later, they bought me a brand new clarinet. So I got off in the clarinet, started getting into all these competitions. Um, but early on, I started um, like what whether you, what one of your uh, uh, friends that you came across, Sarah, said, do something new. So I went from doing the clarinet, jumped into doing the saxophone jumped into playing bass clarinet, uh, jumped into oboe, which, which, which would wind up being my, as crazy as it is, my biggest career thing has been singing. My major in college was, <laughs> was uh, music education with uh, the oboe being my principal instrument, <laughs> which is really crazy. But, and um, so I started, you know, doing that, playing the clarinet, I got a little bit older, a, um, a uh, gentleman, his name was Bill Bell. Um, I mean, he's gone now. He was my mentor, Jesus, from like 15, 14, 15 years old, all the way until his passing, maybe about five years ago. And um, for a long time, he was like my second dad. And um, I would stay at his house for weeks at a time and get up with his kids, his wife and him, they would fix us breakfast, take us all to school, come and pick us up. I'd have dinner with the family. Uh, uh, he made me do my homework. And then I'd go to his, he had a little studio with, he was a, a ranger for a lot of commercials and TV shows. And so he spent, I spent two years being his apprentice and learning how to be an arranger, do music arranging. And so um, later on, when I finally jumped into the, my professional career, which actually started at, um, shoot, 17. Uh, uh, I was doing arrangement, doing horn arrangements and string arrangements for different album projects. And then the synthesizer came along and kind of like wiped out my gig for a while. <laughs> and so doing something new, I really got into playing the piano. I really got into uh, singing. Um, and um, wound up um, performing for a lot of, well, I actually left college early. I went to University of Michigan for two years and left. I got, I, I was really blessed to have been called to do, play saxophone for Earth, Wind & Fire for a couple of months subbing for their saxophonist. And after that, I never went back uh, uh, until three years ago, well, during the COVID, I decided to go back to school and I went to uh, Berkeley College of Music and then finally got my degree from Berkeley College of Music. 
But uh, um, I've been touring with a multitude of people. Jesus, uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire, uh, Rick James, um, Patty Austin, um, Boss Gags. It just goes on and on and on. And then um, through a, a weird circumstance, I ended up becoming a session vocalist. And then wound up being on, I always say, especially the young folks, I say, man, I'm, I'm probably on just about every album your parents have, because I've sang on every, just about every Whitney Houston album, every Aretha Franklin album, every Michael Bolton album, uh, Celine Dion, matter of fact, I won a Grammy uh, um, singing on uh, um, My Heart Will Go On for Celine Dion for the uh, Titanic. And so I've been doing this for a long time and then decided to, to teach. I decided I wanted to do what my mentor um, had, done for me, had done for me and start trying to give back. So even though I still have my professional career doing the things I do, I actually work for the city of Oakland, running a center where we teach music, um, videography, um, culinary arts, and urban gardening. And so I've been doing that since 2011. And in part time, I, I, I teach at San Francisco State or, uh, or and uh, University of the Pacific, just trying in my ways to keep it moving forward. You know, uh, my mentor once said to me, you know, it's great that you know all these things, but if you don't pass it forward, when you pass, it ends with you. And so, um, um, and then there's another thing that, that uh, uh, Sarah said that, that struck home for me is um, if you stay ready, you never have to get ready. You know, and, and, and the truth of the matter is these opportunities for me, when they've, when they've come up, it was really a blessing that I was ready for those opportunities. When it came up for me to sing, I was ready for that. When it came time for me to do uh, all the arranging things that I do now, because I now I'm, I'm an arranger for um, the Grammys, I'm a arranger for Tech Awards and a couple other award shows, and I do a lot of uh, uh, orchestrations and stuff for um, symphonies, including the Oakland Symphony. Um, but it was about being ready when those opportunities came up and learning something new. I mean, to this day, if something comes up that I, that looks interesting, I'm gonna learn it, you know? And that's how you have to, that's to me how you have to be. Um, I can tell you some more little crazy little things about my life, but the reality is, I think if this time would be more better served by you asking me what it is you wanna know and me being able to tell, tell you what, what it is you wanna know. But I do wanna give you, Two, three pieces of advice. I've already gave you one. Don't don't be afraid to learn something new. Um, the other one is, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. And then the other one is, um, well, that's actually it's four. And the next one is, learn to embrace the word no. Make no your best friend, because you're gonna hear a whole lot of no's before you hear finally hear that yes. And you can't let those no's discourage you. Because that one, that one no that discourages you, discourages you, may be the one no before someone was gonna say yes. You know? And so you gotta stick in there and hang in there. And um, and then the final one is something my father told me a long time ago. And to this day is how I live my life. Do something you love, and you'll never work a day in your life. And that's how I feel about my life. I feel like I've never worked a day in my life because it's always been about my music and doing things. I mean, not to say it hasn't been hard, not to say there haven't been challenges because there have, uh, um, but because I'm doing what I love to do, I was able to face the challenges and keep it moving forward and not let things discourage me because I love what I do. Uh, um, I do want to play you a little thing real quick. It's from this production, this company I started with this friend of mine. And we got this one little thing that's coming out. Um, um, I, I would need you to share, give me the ability to share the screen. I think I can. Yep. 
you have to give me the ability to share my screen and I can play this for you real quick. Okay. Trying to figure that out right now. Yeah, probably all you have to do is go up in my name uh, uh, in the list of my name and there should be a little side thing you could click on that says to give me permission to share, give permission to share screen. Sorry, do you know where it is? I don't know. It's in the uh, um, participants area. And then you, you can should click. be able to now, try okay. now. There it is, very good. <laughs> share sound to Bob. Uh, this is a little craziness that we're doing with this rapper it's called No Salt. Yeah. No Salt. Do you remember the name of the song? No oh, salt. yeah, No, no salt. salt. I would hear that drink. Hey, that shit can slap it, bro. <laughs> I'm a Big Mac daddy and a big black patty outside trying to get my dog. I ain't chasing no baddie, they trying to get at me. I still shine like I'm gold. I shine like a solar flare glow, and the game cold like a polar bear toast. Could be a lesson or it might be a blessing. But she'll never know. No <laughs> That's great. Thank you. If you eat healthy and feel your wait a minute, wait a minute. I gotta you gotta try cachava. Cachava is the world's one healthiest. thing I gotta do. Come on, shape. stop. It's made with over seven. There we go. All right, <laughs> y'all about to get a serious commercial for a second. <laughs> so, and just as you as you could tell from me, I'm like a very jovial guy. I like to have fun no matter what, even when it's crazy, I want to have fun. So, you know, let's make this fun. And anything you want to ask of me is not even a problem. I have, I, I, I don't uh, uh, have secrets that I'm afraid of. <laughs> that's, that's a great transition to yeah. our Q and A. Thank you, Clay Tobin. Thank you, Clay Tobin. Uh, thank you guys, it's my honor. Round of applause for all of our panelists really quickly. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open it up to the audience. So don't be shy. I'm sure you all have some burning questions to ask. Um, but if you, when you ask your question, if you could say your name, um, what program you're a part of, um, and then ask, that would be perfect. So who would like to ask a question? Uh, so, yes, first and then back. Um, Mark, um, what, what brands do you work with? What brands? Yeah. Um, so I, I worked on many, many brands, but, um, sorry? Yeah, uh, PlayStation, um, I worked at a lot of healthcare, UCSF, John Muir, What else? There's been so many over the years. Konami, yeah, a lot of just a lot of kind of a lot of tech stuff in in the Bay Area as well. Good question. Yes. Yeah. Um, I had a question for Mr. Richardson. My name is my uh, DJ, and I so he may have to come a little bit yeah. closer for um, the virtual panelists. Appreciate it. Come on down. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yes. um, my name is DJ, and I've been working in real stories for about four years in front of the student board. And I come from a whole family of educators, and I just wanted to know what was it like to try and balance both being an educator as well as pursuing your own career outside of education? For me, uh, to be quite honest, they were synonymous. Um, I deal with teaching as if it were a performance. I deal with it as if I'm like, you know, doing the gig. Uh, I'm cracking jokes, I'm making the whole thing, trying to make the thing, make the whole educational thing fun for folks. Uh, but I, I will, I will, it's, I prefer 
teaching in person, you know, it was kind of like doing a live gig, the whole 2020 thing and having to do classes over Zoom in the beginning was a bit of a challenge till I found a way to be able to um, get my personality to come across via Zoom or Teams and one of those things it was kind of, and it was just kind of weird, you know, cause people started getting to the point where like you're, you're teaching a class and half of the class got their video off. So there's no like eye contact. Uh, other than that, teaching and performing are the same to me in both uh, to be a really good teacher, you have to be really prepared and be prepared to be a performer. It's not just pass along information. It's passing along your 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 vibe, your attitude, your personality to help make the process easier for them. Thank you. Very Very welcome. Other questions in the room? I got one for Larry. Yeah, so uh, I heard Stephen mentioned payback, and I just want to know, as like from like the documented uh, recruiting people for a documentary, just speak. I saw you had like G E Z or like Mr. Top in your uh, uh, interviews. Uh, how hard or how easy is it to like recruit people who are like big names to like to be in your interviews? Yeah, no, great question. Um, it's you know, it's, it's ranges. Uh, it can be very hard. Uh, GED took us four years. We just interviewed them at the end of last summer and we were trying for like four years uh, and just like persistence, like, and then just meeting people, like asking them if they can introduce, like we interviewed Mr. Fab and then he introduced us to some of the new key to see. And then it kind of just goes from there. Just like when you're making a documentary, especially about like community kind of like this is really trying to like bring your trust like really try to become part of the community not make it all about like i'm just trying to get these certain answers from you but really just like build relationships and then uh people will eventually they'll, they'll eventually answer the phone or they'll, they'll eventually introduce you to people so like every interview should be like building a relationship and then following up after sharing clips after keeping them really engaged you know um but yeah i mean mr fab was a cold call we just reached out to him on instagram i, I mean i'd say like half of them we just reached to Reached out to him on Instagram. We're just really patient and um, really told him our intention with it. Like, we really want to try and tell, like, the story from this perspective and, like, really give a, a platform for you guys and, like, really make you guys look good. So, yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, Larry, yeah, if you can get a little closer or speak a little louder, that would be cool. Um, hi, I'm Tara. I'm Um uh, I was, uh, my question is, what, uh, what kind of portfolio uh, or kind of medium did you uh, use to um, get the job at Pixar? Um, you know, I'm trying to remember. I, <laughs> I don't think that I had a reel, um, which is, or I may, you know, I may have had, I mean, I did a lot of student films in, in graduate school. Um, but gosh, I, you know, this is 16 years ago and I'm not remembering what my reel was like, uh, nowadays it's, you know, we're looking at, uh, cinematography reels, we're looking at editing reels. Um, but, um, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not, I'm not remembering, um, the, my only memory is that in my interview, which was with like 10 people. I made people crack up because I used the word Catholic, but not in the way look of like Catholic religion, like in the way in the definition of Catholic meaning universal. I think they were asking me about what I what kind of documentaries I was watching. And I said, oh, my tastes are very Catholic. And they all cracked up and thought that was cool that I used that word in that way. I feel like that's kind of how I maybe got the job, but also they knew. <laughs> <laughs> I think also they knew that I was a good logger and that that I would I would fit in with the vibe of the group and that I, they kind of knew what I was bringing to the table and what I wasn't bringing to the table, quite frankly. Um, but uh, but yeah, but yeah, I, I hope that answers your question. It's not. I don't remember. Maybe we can open that up to everyone if you yeah. all had a real video at all for your job. Also, you got in from like here. 
Say that again. We also got news on light year. Oh, <laughs> light year. Yeah, we're. I mean, we're excited about it. Um, and uh, we're just finishing up our docs right now on light year, and it was really, really terrific. I mean, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> it's gonna be yeah. cool. <laughs> Other questions from the audience? Uh, well, my name is Leanne, and the good news about the shape of the greenhouse. My question for Ray is about the the new hydro project. Because uh, you mentioned that it was originally in Detroit back in the day, I think one of the eight. So I'm wondering what was the original kind of idea you had to do with this because it wasn't necessarily you wanted to show compared to what it was. Yeah, no, awesome. Yeah, great question. Uh, so originally um, it was just kind of like, and this is like the, this is a testament to the power of filmmaking and documentary filmmaking is like, I thought I knew everything about hype as a musical genre and it was supposed to just really focus on the music and like interviewing musicians. I mean, ideally we were like, it'd be so cool if we just got Mr. Fab and that was it. So it grew from there, but like, it was just like, let's talk about hype as a music. And then as we, as you listen to people and talk to them, now, now you're learning that it's more than music. It's like culture. And then you start learning, and then you start talking to more people and you start learning it's more than culture. It was like, it was like a, like an empowering kind of like liberation, like kind of like, like movement, you know, and then then then, they, then you start changing your questions you ask. Um, so really, it's the people that we talk to that help shape like uh, shape the film and help shape the the length. Because then you're like, you're learning like, oh, it's not just about music; it's about culture. We need to talk to way more people than just musicians, and that kind of helped. And that's what expanded it. And then it's just like uh, because it, the Bay Area is so cool and everyone's so like, I don't know, just like creative, but also like really generous with their time and stuff. We were able to talk to a lot of people and then we we're like if we can talk to more people and highlight more people let's make it a longer movie um, and let's not just make about music let's make it about this moment in time that was really important yeah thank you other questions, other questions in the audience yeah, and i thought kind of First of all, I loved your story. How, the story graph that you oh, showed thanks. on yeah, the yeah. Um, do you, like, how do you go about building that out? Do you lose? Yeah, uh, yeah, that was kind of like, I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, I brought on a couple of close friends to be um, other fellow filmmakers that also uh, make some documentary works and narrative. I brought them on to, as like story editors and we just started like having like writer's room sessions, I guess we would call them over Zoom, and we just started talking about like, all right, what's, what footage do we already have? Um, what's the point of the movie? And then we started breaking down the scenes and we're like, let's just, let's just make scenes and then we can figure out the order after. And we're like, what is each scene trying to accomplish? Like what question is it trying to solve? So then we started, then we built out all the scenes and consisting of some footage we already had that we were just like talking about and then stuff we wanted to go get. And then we're like, what's the rise and fall? And we really just, I just started diving into all my old like film um, school books about story. It's literally the same, it's all the same stuff. It translates the same, it's harder in documentary because you have you can't like write what you want them to say. Um, you have to kind of like interview them a certain way. And sometimes what you think is the story beat is not gonna be that. Um, and then you learn a little bit and you move a different way. Uh, but, uh, but sometimes it's way better than writing like an actual, line of dialogue sometimes they say something that's like a thousand times better than what you would have said which is like that's cool but that's that's why i like my documentary story so yeah just yeah. traditional story uh, stuff yeah. i have another question kind of for all of you um i've been kind of doing some freelance dabbling scouts like putting things together um and obviously with you it's a full-time job and the documentary like, uh, you know how do you budget your time do you take time off if you're Maybe if you love it enough, they'll probably leave at some point. It's kind of how you balance your passion and time for rest and read and kind of handle the creative fire. Uh, yeah. The question is how do you balance your time with your passion and just doing personal 
life stuff. And the question's open for everyone. Okay. Yeah, let me, I, I, I'll, I'll chime in real quick. Um, I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. I mean, um, when I'm doing the ranging and session work and stuff like that, along with trying to run a couple of centers, it can be kind of hectic. Um, I do get a bit of time when I get when I when I tour, like in um, October past, I um, toured for about a month, and because you know I was on the record, so I kind of like knew all of the songs. So I I just when it's time to, for the car to pick you up to take you to you know the gig, cool. But the rest of the, all the day you have the day to yourself. So I chill, go sightseeing or whatever where whatever city we're in. So that's usually when I would get my time to really just relax and stuff like that. But during this time right now where I'm doing a lot of arranging for these award shows and, and session work uh, uh, and yeah, I got a schedule when I go, when I go to the bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I guess I'll jump in. You know, I was, I was, I loved um, Mina that you said, you know, uh, maybe in my next career, because I, I think that we all kind of have like a lot of balls in the air. And I know that like, um, for me, I just like to try to change the channel a little bit. And for some reason, I've gotten into like um, woodworking a little bit. I, I met this woman who kind of blew my mind about woodworking. And um, so I do a lot of that on the weekends, just sanding, sanding wood. It gets smoother and smoother. It's so satisfying. Um, I'm, I'm really, I'm really, really lucky that I kind of can turn off um, the emails um, at night and on the weekends. I can't turn off my brain if I can't sleep and I'm thinking about a project or I'm thinking about an approach or a doc or a cut or something. I can't turn off my brain, um, but I, I do try to turn off my emails. And fortunately, I am just, I don't know why I have this old school lifestyle. People don't expect, people expect certain things from me. I don't know. I'm like, I hate Slack. And I get away with saying that. I don't know. So it's, <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I just, you know, just try to keep a little bit of creative stuff. In the air. Um, I, I, uh, I wrote a, I wrote a novel um, kind of, tying into my love of, of mysteries. I wrote a novel a couple of years ago and that would be just, you know, I'm try, I, I try to just be kind of a weekend warrior, like just do my stuff on the weekends, whether it's, you know, go for a walk, which remains one of my all time favorite activities to do, leave the house with a bottle of water and, um, and a good pair of shoes and um, I'm out. That's like my favorite, favorite day. Um, but yeah, that's, that's my, my answer. You're reminding me, Sarah, when you're talking about like sanding wood or like just doing something really simple. So like during this whole thing, I've been worried that I have three kids and they range in age from three to 11 and they're on screens right now. So I can do this presentation, <laughs> um, but, and I'm like, any minute they're going to run in. Um, so, uh, so, my, so my day is really structured where in the morning, my spouse handles getting them all off to school and then after my show is over at 11 and then we have our post-show meeting um, and that ends at noon, then around one, between one and two, I'm out doing all the pickups of the kids. And then I'm on duty until uh, like six or so, and then it's dinner and then I prep for the next day's show. But one of the things that I realized, um, especially during the pandemic, and you probably heard this a lot, I mean, we were so incredible, I'm so incredibly privileged to be able to work at home um, one of the downsides was there was no um, real division. There was no way to set boundaries between work and life. And so I realized after like maybe 18 months into it, it took me that long that I was never alone, like never. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so then I, and I, and it was like, something was crushing my soul. And I'm like, why, why? And I realized it was because I was never doing anything um, alone. And I read this article, I can't remember the, the, the writer, but uh, they wrote something like, what is something that you did pre-work that you just did 
alone, like that you would have done no matter what, just simply because you enjoy it. And I just started to make a list. Like I, and it was really kind of silly. Like I, I did jigsaw puzzles and I looked at fashion magazines and I, you know, and I was like, oh my God, that's what I got to do. So then I like bought uh, a puzzle. I subscribed to a magazine just to, to create um, moments for me to be able to do things by myself that I would have done anyway pre-work because I couldn't even remember like what those things were uh, after a while. And just giving yourself, even if it's just a little bit of time, but you're doing something that you enjoy doing and um, and you realize that you enjoy doing it because you did it before work, <laughs> before you worked um, all the time, get sort of the, your creative energy back a little bit. It gives, gives you just that little bit of mind space sometimes that can spark a creative idea. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just um, add to Sarah. I love sanding. I <laughs> sand lots of wood and love that things getting smoother. But uh, but yeah, I mean, part of the deal with being an independent filmmaker when you're making a documentary is your, your production depends on funding. So there's lots of downtime trying to get funding. Um, so and then and then when your shoots come up, you, you're up and you, and you go do them. But as far as uh, just relaxing, I think one thing I'm trying to do more is get off the computer. So I, a lot of times I'll, my questions I'll formulate, I'll, I'll work on a sketchbook or I'll work on a mind map. And actually that's how I ask questions in my interviews. I don't write, write someone asks me like, what are the questions? Like, I don't know, I'll have, I'll have subjects that we'll talk about, but it's, I can show up a mind map and it's just, these are the questions. Um, and then the other thing is just, uh, I, I, Combine, have combined two things that, I, that um, have made my life more enjoyable. We have to get around, and I use it, my bike to get around. So I, I just love riding my bike. I ride my bike here. I took a ride to the park earlier. Um, but that's sort of a big release for me, just to be it's the closest thing to flying that I have. <laughs> I just love getting out, feeling the wind. Yeah, the only thing I'd add to it is just like kind of like what Clay Tobin said, if you love your if you're if you're pursuing your passion and it's something you truly love, it doesn't feel like work. I mean making we were hyphy while working was a lot of a lot of after work time, a lot of weekends, but I was making I was making a movie with my friends and about something that I really cared about and met a lot of my heroes. So it didn't it was hard work, but it didn't always feel like work it, it was like working towards something that you really like care about so I think like pick a project if you're going to work on it while working pick something that you really care about you know that really means a lot to you and it won't feel it won't feel like you're losing all this time yeah. um, questions from the audience yes um, a question for um, both Mark and I, um, where uh, do you find the most inspiration from? And um, like, is it from just like everyday life or is it your most recent thing? Uh, well, a big factor in a lot of my work and inspiring me is, is activists. So a lot of the filmmaking we're doing now is, is centered around environmental and social justice. Uh, we're doing a, a film right now on uh, Leah Penniman, who's a black farmer who wrote a book called Farming While Black. Uh, and you know, almost every documentary, I, I dive into the world and now I want to be a farmer, as well as a, a wood sander. <laughs> but I, I, um, I find inspiration just in, in a lot of the passion that the people we interview. And, and you know, I, my first film was a love story, a dramatic love story, but I find that in all my documentaries are basically love stories. They're, I fall in love with my characters and want to share their stories, and, and uh, they're, they're my big source of inspiration. Yeah, I agree. Meeting the documentary, meeting people, and just sitting and talking to them, whether it's the pre interview, phone call, or when you're actually sitting recording, like. That's so super inspiring. And then for me, if I feel like I'm hitting a wall or like I'm not 
I don't know, I need like some kind of spark. I'll, I'll watch watch other documentaries and other films and just kind of turn your mind off. And then I just, like, you just naturally start coming up with ideas. And like, you see something that's really cool, like an editing maneuver, or like the way they approach a certain interview question. But yeah, just like watching other um, films. Yeah. Other audience questions? Um, what part oh. of the uh, fair is uh, uh, for me. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, so the Bay Area, uh, like where we filmed the movie. Yeah. So a lot. Of, uh, I'd say like eighty-five percent was in Oakland. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of Oakland. Um, and then um, some stuff in the city. Um, some stuff in Sacramento. Uh, kind of all over, but I'd say predominantly a lot of the B-roll and stuff is Oakland. Uh, yeah. Yes. Well, I was trying to get. This is for like everybody. Um, I have a question for like like doing more filming and stuff. Like, have you ever like scared that you never got creative views or get any views? Did everyone catch that uh, uh, virtually? So um, the question was about whether you're afraid of not getting enough views on your videos or things like that, uh, taking it like what, YouTube and like social media and stuff? Yeah, like movie ratings. Yeah, and movie ratings. Or your morning talk show host ratings. Yeah. <laughs> For Mina. It's for everyone. Well, I, I'll start, you know, we're all human. So yeah, you, you, you do your work, you're sharing a part of yourself. So yeah, of course you want people to see things. Um, yeah, it's, it's important, but I think what's most important is that you're doing a story or the work that excites you. And that's, that's, that's what should be driving you. It's not what, whether people see it or not. But if it's true to what you want to do or what you're you're expressing as an individual, then that's the most important thing. Um, similarly, like so, my show is is live, and whenever we do a topic, we're like, "What if no one comments or calls into the show? Like, no one's gonna like, no one's into it." Um, but I think one of the things that's that's really important is not to judge your success or the importance of the topic that you're putting out there based on the reaction you're getting because you never know you never know who's watching who's listening and why or you know whether or not you know just because they didn't subscribe or they didn't do you know whatever to your you have no idea sometimes the reach or impact that you're getting that doesn't show up in a in a meter right uh, that's that's counting clicks or views um, and if you really believe in what you're putting out there, something that people need to hear, and sometimes you're putting it out there to show an audience that may not exist yet for you, that you are seeing them and you and you are inviting them to the space, and it takes a little bit longer. So, so you know that that should drive what constitutes success. For me, in the audio world, um, it's like what was said earlier. What drives me and what I really feel is what makes me feel good. If the music I'm doing makes me feel good, then I'm cool. Um, from the human side, sometimes, every now and then, you know, if you're not getting the, the, the type of attention or the type of likes you want in a certain period of time, it could have like a, sometimes it used to have a really weird effect on me until one thing happened to me that stopped me from doing that. I was at a grocery store one day and um, standing in line behind these two ladies. They didn't know me from Adam. I didn't know them either. And the music in the um, store came on, was on. And there was a song that played that I was singing lead on. It was a song called You Make Me Believe in Love by, um, oh man, a uh, 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 blanket out. But the song's called You Make Me Believe in Love. I was by Kenny G and I was singing lead on it. And um, 
it wasn't get it wasn't moving like you know like me watching the charts or whatever and watching likes and social media and it wasn't hitting like I thought it was so I was feeling some kind of way until this moment I'm standing in line and the ladies are sitting there and that song comes on the music in the store and one of the, the girl one of the women turned to the other one and said girl that's my jam <laughs> <laughs> and in that moment I'm like wow this is really cool they don't even know me you know what I mean <laughs> I'm sitting there going wow they tripping on this song and what you know and in that moment I realized it doesn't matter how many people view you it matters if the right people view you that are getting the point that you're trying to make getting the object of what you're trying to put across. And you never know who that is. You don't know. Like in that instance, I didn't know. It just, I just happened to be lucky enough that an opportunity came for me to actually hear someone's honest take on what I had done. You know what I mean? So it doesn't always come like that. You just gotta just be satisfied with what you do. Said it better. <laughs> uh, I have another question for uh, for Mina. Uh, so you said you do uh, live shows uh, for KQED, is that correct? Uh, so how do you uh, not succumb to the pressure of being live? Or if you do, uh, you somehow do you get? Uh, how do you recover from that? Sorry, you said how do you, who do how do I not succumb to the pressure of what? Of being, uh, live. being live. Oh, <laughs> well, there's something really sort of, uh, you're sort of forced to surrender. <laughs> like, uh, it is what it is kind of thing. And you kind of just have to sort of approach it as like a Zen-like moment. Um, but I am always, I am always a little bit nervous. I'm always a little bit like, okay, like, what I'm going to put out there or what's going to be put out there is going to happen. It was interesting hearing Larry talk about, you know, you can't, you can't predict what someone's going to say in a documentary and you definitely cannot predict what someone's going to say on the radio. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I think it's a combination of things. One is that um, you, you just sort of have to accept that what is, is like, you can't take it back. It's just going to happen in the moment. You can't produce it. You can't prep it. You can't edit it. You can't do anything with that. And, and just sort of be present in that moment. The other thing that I have found out from our audience, as much as they're very happy to tell you, uh, to give you critical feedback, they are very forgiving about the live aspect of it. They really understand that you're you're doing something in the moment. So a lot of times, you know, sometimes I'll be like, oh my gosh, that was a horrific thing that happened. And you'll, you'll realize that there are a lot of people out there who understand the medium. And in fact, listen because of that, like listen because they, they want something sometimes that isn't pre-produced, you know, it, it just is. And so I think those are the two things that, that help me get past the nerves. Other questions from the audience? I got a not important follow-up question for Sarah and Mark. What's your favorite grid of sandpaper? <laughs> Sarah? Oh, you're muted, Sarah. I said, you got to love it when you get to 320 or 400. That means you've, you've done 80 and 120 and yeah, no, you've, you're there. <laughs> I disagree. <laughs> now I, I'm actually working on with a lot of old growth wood that was um, oh. taken by house. So I'm, I'm, I really enjoy that. Really drop eighty grit just to take out <laughs> all the all the, the Personally, stuff. two K uh, for me. So. <laughs> it's it's kind of like editing, you know, real fast. <laughs> Have you uh, done collab? If so, how's that like um, 
uh, talk about or share about the next month. Yeah, so for Mina, um, the question was, how do you sort of initiate collaborations or do you do any collaborations um, on the forum? Yeah, actually, I'm not going to do it this time, but I've done this before, but we have done a, a collaboration with Youth Radio where um, it's called Youth Takeover and they take over the airwaves. And I think next week, Alexis is going to have a, a co-host. I'm not sure what what age. Um, so I think it's high school um, with with him on on the radio on one of the shows. And then there'll, there'll be a couple of other shows so that we do those collaborations and then um, we also do collaborations with the Center for Investigative Reporting, um, and yeah, so so we we do collaborations on forum quite a bit, and uh, and and right now we're actually thinking about ways to have recurring guests with projects that are really cool to highlight and and do things with, with regard to people who are doing things in. Um, science or in food or like all kinds of stuff. So I don't know if that answers your question, but, um, or do you mean like, do we do collaborations like on the air with people? I guess we do both. So uh, meaning like uh, hosting collaborations with other people. Like we did, I, I did this series of uh, specials with other radio stations, with stations in California, um, like Cap Radio when there's something going on in Sacramento. And we've also tried this thing that was called Swap Talk, where we did, um, we co-hosted with public radio stations in other states. So in Oregon, or like I think we did one in Illinois, I'm trying to remember. But the idea was to kind of have these two audience in different states who may have questions about how each other does things um, to talk to each other. So those are some of the th projects that we've done. Uh, um, have any of y'all hand down uh, uh, plastic canvas? So, <laughs> what do you recommend? Because I'm actually trying to use that for all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you have to say it, you got to talk about it. I'm, I'm afraid I, I can't help you on that. <laughs> plastic, I, I just want to say um, wear a mask. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I echo that. Wear a mask for sure. Yeah. Black. Does Bayback have a standing flag? Yes. Um, I have a question for the documentary. Uh, how would you kind of go about finding funding for your documentary, especially if it's a passion project for yourself? Like this is just something that you've always wanted to make and it's a little bit difficult to be like specific or things like that or just doesn't feel like there would be a lot about like trying my funding how would you kind of go about that without pulling from your own pocket i i did pull a little bit from my pocket just uh we didn't have any official funding and a lot of uh, people just volunteered their time and and may or may not have borrowed a lot of gear from work. Uh, from record, but I, I know for my next project, I want to look, I want to dive more into grants and learn more about that. I think there's a lot of, uh, not a lot, but there's some potential. And if you really um, have planned it out well, have a good concept, and you know what you want, uh, the grants might be, there's grants out there that you like to Mark has some advice. Yeah. Every time I say I'm not going to spend my own money on. A film, I spend some of my own money I'm trying to get trying to get better at that. Um, but yeah, that's the no pun intended the million dollar question: like how do you get funding? And it's um, it can come from many different sources, but it sort of goes back to what we said earlier: it's that it's that passion that you have for the story. That's that's what's going to get you the fund. That's what, what's going to get you the meetings. Um, but yeah, I, I'm this current film. We are going down the the foundation route, and that's a whole whole industrial complex in itself. Uh, but there's lots of resources online to you know how you how you write a grant and what they're looking for. They're trying.
trying to make that process easier. It's a sort of a basic form, but they're never all the same. You have to have, you have to tailor each one of the foundations or whatever it is. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not the fun part of filmmaking. Sure. Thank you. I know I'm not on the panel, but just to add there, because you all are in the age range of like 14 to we'd say 26, there are a lot of different programs that really offer certain funding, whether that's for development, for pre-production, production, post-production post distribution. So they're all out there. So even if you feel like it's far reaching, um, they look at all the applications. And so it's good to just like get into that practice. And as um, uh, mentioned earlier, you know, like it's, it's a process and, you know, don't feel that once you get that no, that it's the end all be all, just keep applying because you never know who will be on that team, who will be reviewing applications and really like, be able to, your passion will shine through. Yeah. Um, so we've got about five more minutes. Are there any more questions before we start to wrap up? Burning questions from anyone. Quite over there, quite over. I know, but uh, for, uh, I imagine doing the pre Grammy show music uh, with deadlines and pressure can be you know, intense. So uh, for my students, I was curious, what advice would you give them to kind of push past any like creative blocks and uh, be able to create content on in, in time there? Um, the biggest thing is time management. Um, I have what I, I do, what I call the Scotty method. If some of you are a little bit young to know who Scotty is. Uh, Scotty was the engineer for Captain Kirk, the Star oh, Trek. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and so uh, Cap the captain would come to him and say, Scotty, we got to get this engine running because, you know, we got we to be able to get out of this universe or whatever. And then Scotty would say, you know, Captain, the lithium crystals are tripping out or whatever. It's going to take me eight hours. It's going to take me eight hours to do this. And then the captain turned around and say, oh, you got five hours. And then Scotty go, okay, it winds up getting it done in two. But he took the four, five hours just in case, you know, it might take him that long. <laughs> and that way there's no pressure. There's no real pressure. And then on top of it, because he did it in like two or three hours, instead he winds up being the hero. So the whole thing is about time management. We have, a, we all, I think we all have a tendency sometimes, I know I do for sure, have a tendency to overcommit time-wise, you know what I mean? And then all of a sudden there's this pressure because this commitment I made to this date is I know it's not gonna happen, but now I've made that commitment. So the main thing is just to, if you think it's gonna take you two days, tell them four. If you think it's, you know what I mean? If you think it's gonna take, take you a month, tell them two, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Uh, so you have time to get it done without the pressure. And like I said, if you come in before that, before that time, now you're the hero because you got it done early. You know, it's just the whole salesman trick, <laughs> the Scotty method. Uh, um, yeah, that's 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 the main thing. And 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 don't be afraid to ask for help. Uh, um, you know, I've been doing doing this for a long time, and every now and then, especially when it comes to the the, the Grammy thing, you know, I'll like have to have somebody come in and, and help me with printing out the parts and doing different things, some of the busy work, so I can concentrate on the main thing of getting the arrangements and stuff done. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Uh, those are the main things as far as time. Also, before I go, I want to say one thing. Thank you, Evan. It's an honor for me to do this. Uh, uh, Evan was one of my students at San Francisco State, and here he is bringing me in on some. <laughs> it's really an honor. And um, um, and the other thing I want to say, uh, you guys are really blessed to be a part of this program. I have the honor of actually being a part-time teacher uh, when this program was in Oakland years, years ago. 
It's a great program. And over the years, it's gotten even better. So really take advantage of this opportunity that you have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're at two minutes, and I wanted to finish up with one final question. We've had a wealth of wisdom and encouragement and advice come through. So I wanted to just have every, uh, all the panelists, just as a last hurrah, just share any last words and advice that you would like to share with our young people today. So, uh, Claire, you mind starting? And we can go from in person and we'll shift over to virtual. Yeah, I guess my final advice is just keep making art with your friends. And if one friend's a musician and you're a videographer or a film person, make a music video together. Just collaborate because it's all, you know, it's, it's inspire each other. Yeah, uh, I'll second that and saying this, this is a, an amazing tool and many people are using it to, to do talking about. Um, one practical advice I would say is that you know, if you're if you're going into film production, probably your first job will be as a production assistant. You'll be first one on set. You'll be you know, asked to do things that, of course, everyone wants to direct. But if you're starting as a PA, your whole goal is to be invited back by the producer. So be the best PA that you could possibly be. Wear sensible shoes. <laughs> that PA show up with clogs, and they weren't invited back. <laughs> so wear sensible shoes, have a great attitude, and, and you'll come back. And then you'll you'll the producer will start to say, what area do you want to work in? Do you want to work in producing? Do you want to work in camera? Do you want to work, you know, in other areas? And they will, if you have a great attitude, they'll try to find the spot for you in those departments. So be the best PA you can be on the first day with sensible shoes. <laughs> Just something you can run around. Yeah, those are good. Yeah, those are good. Yeah. And then we'll toss it over to our virtual space. Um, Clay Tobin, since I see you first, and then we'll do Clay Tobin, Sarah, then wrap it up with Nina. Oh, man. Um, aside from the things that I've already told you, um, it's important to have the best attitude that you can ever have. It's important to be that person that's likable. It's important to be that person that can get along with others. We all wanna work with people we like, you know what I mean? And um, I've gotten a lot of gigs based on my personality when there were other people that I know that sing way better than me. <laughs> it could play way better than me, but I got the gig because of who I am and the person that I am. So that's really, really important to be the best person that you can be. Great, that's awesome. Um, I'll give you four things. None of them are mine, they're all stolen. My partner, I was talking about this talk this morning and she said, you know, there's no artist, uh, there's no, sorry, there's no manual for being an artist. And I was like, damn, that's so true. Um, whatever your path is, you know, don't doubt it, um, just stick to it. There's no right way to do this stuff. Um, whatever, however way you feel that you need to approach it, you're just follow it. Um, three pieces of advice from Tony Kaplan, who is my mentor here at Pixar. This is like basically, this is like Tony Kaplan's film school. The camera always comes with you. Audio is more important than video and don't be stingy with the gaff tape. <laughs> yeah, 